and I will stop sharing and pass it off to Jennifer. Okay, well, hello everyone from, uh, <clears throat> oh, I see I'm here all by myself. I haven't spoken to anyone today, really, so my voice is uh, a bit crackly, and of course it's an hour earlier. And I woke up this morning and it is, was 37 degrees out, so it's been a rather dramatic uh, temperature drop. So what we thought is this, that this is really a gallery walkthrough and you will enter this space through, through the door on uh, Monterey. And this is what you would see for the most part. But perhaps, yes, good, good job, Mary, let's pan around. Um, it's, a, I think, a very warm, inviting kind of space. And maybe we can tilt up a little bit towards the ceiling. There we go. And I think part of the warmth of, <clears throat> of this space is because there, as you can see, there's no traditional gallery lights, the whole exhibition is lit by just <laughs> floor lamps and, and the chandelier. And uh, with that red wall, I do think it makes it an inviting and warm space to enter. But perhaps before you even entered the door, you will have noticed some jelly preserves. Uh, and certainly if you have walked by in the evening, uh, you may have seen these glowing kind of in the dark because um, there is special lighting for the evening so people can observe this. Uh, my own experience, and, and if anyone's visited yet, <clears throat> generally speaking, the preserves look uh, more dramatic from the inside looking out rather than the outside looking in. But maybe we can come up a bit closer and I can talk about these. One of the things I thought about when I was preparing for this installation was the fact that um, this gallery and, and the museum as a whole, of course, is in um, the Mexican War Streets, a residential neighborhood, and there were um, kind of corner stores, and I don't know quite the history of this particular building, but certainly this read to me <clears throat> as more store-like as opposed to a residence. Sorry, my voice. Um, and so by putting these preserves in it, it really felt like I was kind of setting up a, a store display, inviting people. And these were up relatively early before the show actually opened. And I think people were wondering, you know, what, what is going to be here? Now, this is a great shot because I've described these as jelly preserves, but in fact, they are insect jelly preserves. And uh, I talked about the warm space. I think part of the warmth comes from these insect jellies that are acting a bit like stained glass. Uh, I think of museum exhibits I visited uh, where there are things in formaldehyde floating. And these definitely have that kind of feel. So originally I had this idea when I was working on a project in which I created uh, Victorian era collectors and specifically some teenage girls. Uh, and I contrived this whole story that they were amateur entomologists. And I was thinking about young women in the Victorian era. You know, they would, uh, of course, read, write, perhaps study literature, a language, um, and probably not science. Yet, if you had this interest and you wanted to collect specimens, how would you do that? Well, I felt like young women knew how to make preserves, so why not preserve insects? A lot of people ask me, can you eat this? And uh, I think we're all feeling a bit like it is the apocalypse at the moment. And uh, I would say, yes, you could, but only if it was your, <laughs> your last bit of food. Um, the jelly is made the way you make jellies, with pectin, sugar, and all of these have a natural colorant in them. So 
uh, there's turmeric, um, there's green tea. Uh, I'm trying to think, I can't think of it off the top. There's rose hip. Um, anyway, all of, they're all natural colors. The insects inside them, you know, it's, I have long, um, I've been keeping these a long time because all the insects in my work are reused from exhibition to exhibition. And if something gets broken, it gets repaired with glue <laughs> and uh, it gets, it goes back up onto the wall. The repaired specimens typically aren't so pristine, so they go high up or low down. But sometimes I can't repair something because I don't have its part. So most of these insects have lost a leg. And what I've learned over the years is, is that it's that negative space uh, between their legs or their wings that really forms the pattern. And when an insect is missing a limb, it spoils the pattern. Yet other than that, the insects themselves were really quite nice. So I saved them for a long time. And when I had this jelly idea, uh, I brought them out. They are on various botanical matter because initially I thought, oh yeah, I'll make the jelly and I'll drop them in. And what I didn't realize is, is that they're so light, they floated to the top. And so I needed to have the botanical matter. I used a heat resistant glue to glue them first and then cut the uh, stick or stem exactly the right uh, length so that then they would be propped up. And then the jars are sealed with beeswax and they are all labeled. The label on them says their species and the colorant. And if it has a date on it, it is the date that the insect was named given its Latin nomenclature. So that's what you first see when you walk in. And I think it sets a tone from the street. Perhaps it suggested a street, uh, a store. But from inside, it has a more scientific read of botanical matter and in preserved insects. So let's take a look at these walls now, which I've already referred to. And if you have a question, I think specifically, uh, maybe before we move on, if you have a question specifically about the insect jelly, it might be better uh, to answer that question while I'm there uh, than come, come back later. So. Yes, feel free to chat your questions at any time, or you can hit that raise hand button and that'll, that'll indicate to unmute you. So feel free to ask any questions about the fantastic insect jellies that um, were quite, quite interesting to passerby during install and now. <laughs> yeah, and I should add too that because of the beeswax seal that there is also a that aroma of kind of sweet beeswax in, in the air as well. So the red wall I, I described as warm, and now it is actually painted with an insect colorant called cochineal. Cochineal is a scale insect. Uh, it is in the same family actually as lice, which is kind of unappealing, uh, but this is a an insect that is cultivated as a crop. It's used in the food and cosmetic industry as, as a colorant. So for example, a few years ago, uh, Starbucks had, uh, pr was promoting a new smoothie that they claimed to be vegan. And then it turned out that it was in fact being colored with cochineal and therefore was not vegan. But uh, anyone who's wearing lipstick has probably got a little bit of insect or bug juice, as I like to say, on their lips. So red, I actually teach textile design. And so I know that red is one of the hardest colors to achieve uh, through, through natural dyes. I mean, prior to cochineal, the closest, um, you know, historically anyway, uh, dye, red dye was matter. And it's uh, more sort of a terracotta brick red. So the Spanish came to the New World and they saw these stunningly beautiful red textile scarlet. And when they asked what the dye stuff was, they were shown 
these cochineal insects, but if you were to see them, and I think, Mallory, there, there might be a little bottle um, there that you could perhaps uh, show. I know I left a bottle of the insects. They look like perhaps tiny pebbles or seeds. Oh, there, there they are. Excellent. You can see me up in the top here. I have Mary spotlighted, but you should yeah. be able to see my screen as well. Right. Yeah, and they really, they really do look like either seashells or little pebbles or something. Very yeah. interesting to see that. Yeah, so it's the only the female that produces the red color. And as I said, they're cultivated um, in, in Latin America. They are, they basically, I often say world's most boring insect because they find their place on a cactus, a nopal cactus, and they spend their entire lives there. And once the females have laid their eggs, then they're scooped up and they're put onto mats uh, and they just, they don't even seem to have the wherewithal to make a break for it. They just kind of curl up and die. And then they're dried. And then if you grind them, uh, they become this powder. And in fact, I've just been doing some cochineal dyeing with my students um, this semester uh, in this online teaching world. And it's too bad. I should have thought of that. I just... I did a sample this morning and uh, I put it outside, otherwise I would show it ever, to everyone. So anyway, I painted the wall with this and it isn't a paint. So if you do come to the exhibition and see it in person, you'll see that it's, it's a little bit streaky, patchy. Uh, I believe that we put three coats of it onto the, the wall. Uh, so it is a really nice deep red. And right now we've got natural sunlight coming through the window. So um, it perhaps looks a little uneven, which it is uneven, but more so, more so than ever. So that explains the color of the wall. It makes sense to put my so-called insect wallpaper on top of an insect colorant. And that diamond pattern that you see there is composed of four cicadas. All of, and even those smaller ones are cicadas as well. Cicadas, uh, I'll step back a moment and say that virtually every insect in my exhibition that has wings is either a cicada or a grasshopper. So these, their name is uh, Tosena splendida, the ones with the blue wings, and they come from Thailand. Thailand has the world's greatest uh, diversity of cicadas. So we probably wouldn't even recognize them as being cicadas because we're used to the ones with the clear wings, but they have them in blue and green and red. It's really very remarkable. And the, why do I use cicadas and grasshoppers? In part because I wanted to use insects that we haven't thought of as being beautiful before. Everyone knows that butterflies and moths are pretty but also for a simple reason that these stand up better to the wear and tear of reuse. They're quite hardy creatures. In addition to the insect pattern, and most people take a moment before they realize, wow, that pattern is made with insects, um, are the bell jars on these shelves. And within a bell jar, there is an insect or sometimes two. There is some kind of botanical matter and the insects appear to be looking at a Victorian era microscope slide. So again, there's this kind of scientific reference with the microscope slide, but it's also a little bit whimsical too, in that I often say, this is Horton, here's a who. So remember that Dr. Seuss story where Horton is trying to protect the dust speck on the flower because there are creatures, he, there's somebody living in it. And then towards the end of the story, you find out that they on their dust speck <clears throat> are trying to protect something as well. And so we've got insects, small certainly compared to us, looking at smaller creatures themselves and who knows how far that could go on. So maybe we can move more central to the wall to the skull motif. 
Jennifer, we do have a question and a comment. Um, I'll start with Haley's comment, noting the shadows on the walls that are coming from the jars, put an extra special layer of yeah. of pattern over the piece. Mm -hmm. um, and Rosie asks, um, and you, you touched on this a little bit, uh, where the insects are sourced from and yeah. how that process works. Yeah, so the insects come from specimen dealers and um, many of these insects, like these fancy ones that we're looking at right now, the ones that mimic leaves, uh, the common name is the moving leaf, and the bigger one above that is called, uh, the common name is the thorny stick. That's actually the female of this species. And I do know we have some males. Let's see, I'm trying to remember where they are in this, perhaps higher up. Let me point to me. Ah, there, right at six o'clock. The one with the big pink wings, that is the male of the species, not the purple one, but lower. There we go, that's the, that's the male. So these are very prized by collectors and these are actually farmed. Certainly um, you probably, if you traveled to a tropical place, you may have had the opportunity to visit a butterfly farm, but there are lots of insects that are farmed. In fact, the insects that are making up the skull pattern if we can go to that. Those are from Papua New Guinea and they are part of a, of a development project. Again, an insect that's very prized by collectors. It's um, the bigger uh, species name is Eupholus and there's in this uh, Eupholus magnificus, uh, Eupholus uh, benetti. Uh, they are beautiful weevils. Uh, that are metallic in color. And so those have also been farmed. And I also have some grasshoppers that come from a project in Madagascar. And the insects that aren't farmed are collected by the indigenous people that live in, in that area. And so I often say that insects are a renewable resource as long as they have a habitat. So, I mean, of course, we're seeing these terrible wildfires on the West Coast. <clears throat> and it's, I mean, for so many reasons, it's devastating. And for sure, uh, insect species are threatened. Uh, and why are they important? You know, we tend to think of them as a, a nuisance, but obviously um, not just bees, but other insects are pollinators. But perhaps even more important than that is, is that they are an important part of the food, food chain. So if you're seeing fewer birds, and I've been reading, I'm sure as you have, about all the birds that they're finding um, deceased in Arizona, New Mexico, and they, they're migratory birds, that they have been forced to leave um, the forest early due to the fire. They've flown great distances. So they're thinking that that might be a problem, but on their journey, there's a suggestion that there are fewer insects. And we know that that, that to be true from a, a very important study that was published in two seven, 2017, a study in Germany, which found that, what was it, 65% of winged insects had disappeared in an under 30 year period. So that is, that is an apocalypse, and it's not something that people tend to care about, but it's kind of appropriate to talk about that now as we look at this skull, which has really been a symbol of man's mortality and made up with insects. And our existence on this planet is very much tied to insects, whether we want to believe that or not. I read a, a fact that we have approximately six weeks on this planet without insects. We need them for pollination. We need them for the decomposition of matter and their importance to the food chain. So, Angel, yes. Correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, and my apologies if I didn't say this in the beginning, but the title of this piece is The Museum of Everything. And my understanding was that that does relate to the role that insects play in our, in our ecosystem. Absolutely. I mean, the Museum of Everything really came from partially a cabinet of curiosities so that uh, they were really developed in the Renaissance era and uh, wealthy, the royalty, wealthy merchants would 
create these cabinets that uh, had religious and secular art. It had uh, uh, what sort of biological matter specimens and whatnot. The, in, they really were a kind of museum of everything. And I should add too that a cabinet of curiosities it, it initially referred to a whole room. The room was a cabinet, that it was an immersive experience. And so there is a kind of library type feel with all of these specimens, these drawers, which I'll talk about shortly, um, of things. But also, as Mallory uh, just said, it's also a nod to insects being everything really to man. Of course, we need, <laughs> we need uh, air to breathe and water to drink. But insects are just so important to ecosystems, which of course are wildly out of balance at the moment. So we talked a bit about the skull and its significance and um, back to that question. So the insects do, do come from insect specimen dealers. When they come to me, depending on the species, some of them are already prepared, such as the large leaf mimic ones, but most of them have to be uh, what's known as relaxed and pinned. They're kind of curled up, um, not, not fetal-like, but anyway, um, their, their legs are tucked in, their wings are in. And so relaxing is essentially rehydrating them. And then you pin them into position and then they dry that way. It just happens, it has, I have to do it once. It is a very labor intensive activity. Um, but that's how the insects come. They're typically called papered insects, uh, by the way, because they come on a piece of cardboard that's wrapped in cellophane. And as I said, I've been reusing these. Some of these have been going for nearly 20 years. And <laughs> there's a cicada that I can tell comes from an exhibition in two, 2003 at the North Dakota Museum of Art that the insects were on the wall and then someone had the bad idea of touching up the wall and actually got a bit of paint on the wings of, of the cicadas. So when I see those ones, I can go, okay, you've been around for a while. But it just shows how if you take care of something. So when the exhibition is down, uh, the insects are pinned onto foam core boards. According to species, they go into storage boxes that are airtight with some naphthalene, essentially mothballs. Um, and uh, until the next show. Now, anything with wings will fade over time. So the cicadas, the leaf mimic, but beetles retain their color. All right, maybe, maybe we should go to the cabinet. I was gonna go to the, to the table, but I think we should go to the cabinet because one, you've been seeing, um, we had a close up a short time ago of some of the drawers. And there is a large cabinet. Now I did say a cabinet, traditionally a cabinet referred to an entire room, but there is this piece of furniture here, which maybe now is a good time, Mary, to turn the iPad vertically so we can try and get the whole. <laughs> there we go. Okay, there's the cabinet. This cabinet is, has 130 drawers. And there's several, I did point out a few things that were new already for me with this exhibition. And that is, is that it's entirely lit by, what shall we call it, domestic lighting. The other thing, this cabinet, I have shown it twice before, but this is the first time where I had actually finished filling all 30, uh, 130 drawers. So I had 40 uh, in its first two uh, showings, there were 40 drawers, the top four rows that were missing. And I, I had to get this, it kind of got stuck in a COVID quarantine, but I was able to get the drawers out and finish them. And when you've done that amount of work, it's kind of frustrating that people can't see everything. And so I really wanted to figure out a way that I could share more of what was in, in the drawers. And so that's when I came up with the idea of the shelving that you've seen that's going around the perimeter of the room. 
And so I think there are 63 drawers out for people to see, plus <clears throat> the ones that you see open here. And I was kind of nervous about having these gaps. How would it look? And that's when I had this idea of the birds <laughs> that you will have noticed that I have sort of decided to roost uh, in the, the cabinet. And we'll talk more about the taxidermied animals uh, later. But as to what is happening in these drawers, I really see them as kind of little worlds, a bit snow globe-like. And the insects, for the most part, have been anthropomorphized. They are standing, insects have six legs, they are standing kind of on their hind legs. And the reason I've done that is, is that if you get nothing else out of this exhibition, I hope that you will leave thinking about insects differently and having, um, if not a liking for them, perhaps a respect. And in anthropomorphizing them, I think that it makes you think, oh, well, insects you know, have jobs, which indeed they do have jobs, um, not the same as ours, but they do have jobs, they do have families. And so within the drawers, the insects are carrying out activities. They are often appear to be instructing, <laughs> and that would be a reflection of my occupation as a professor. Uh, they're often reading. They're also often doing textile type activities, which again is a nod to what I teach. But I also think too about, we describe insects as being industrious. And the first area to be mechanized in the Industrial Revolution was the textile industry. So I like the connection there. So here are those birds um, that I was talking about. Those have been borrowed from the Carnegie um, Natural History Museum, which does have a loan program, and they very graciously lent these. I really wanted to have Pennsylvanian animals for this. And let me say those things on top of the cabinet, those conical, um, what shall I call them, <clears throat> baskets, those are traditional bee skeps. So if there's anyone here who has done beekeeping, uh, before we had those square box um, hives, these were, they're actually, they are a basket, they're woven and then mud is, is placed on them. Apparently, it's illegal now in the U.S. to keep your bees this way. I imagine if you were just, you know, an individual beekeeper, you could. But if you're in the commercial honey business, that's not allowed. Interestingly enough, these came from Bulgaria. So whether they're still doing it there, I'm not quite sure. But of course, it seemed important to, to have this reference there. Okay. Um, Let's go to the dinner party. So in the center of this room <clears throat> is a dinner party. And I, as I've already said, I wanted to have Pennsylvanian animals. I have done two other versions of the dinner party. The very first one was a Northwoods so Wisconsin dinner party, which was at the Villa Terrace Museum in Milwaukee. And then the second one was more recent. It was at the Museum of Fine Art in St. Petersburg, Florida. And there I had a Floridian, native Floridian uh, dinner party. And uh, what is the point of the dinner party? Well, it really comes back to insects. So, <clears throat> Uh, I can talk about this in a number of ways, but I'll tell you how I first thought about it, was I had been doing research on Victorian era museums, uh, particularly in Europe. And the, the museum itself comes into existence kind of in the late Victorian era. So the, the forerunner of a museum is a cabinet of curiosities, where these people who had them actually started charging people would sell tickets and allow people to come. And then uh, came the idea that this should, you know, the greater public should be able to, to see them. And thus the museum is born around, you know, 1880 or so. And when you walk into these museums that still don't look any different from the day they open, 
they are typically natural history museums. And if you have the opportunity to go to the Natural History Museum in Paris or in Dublin, the Irish Natural History Museum, it is a bit overwhelming because I think in 2020, we are not used to seeing so many skeletons. And when I say so many, I'm talking like a football sized room of skeletons and then up on the next floor, taxidermy just everywhere and some of it kind of sad honestly that um, it hasn't necessarily been preserved and for me when I saw these museums I thought the arrogance of this now when I think back to when they were established I don't think there was any notion that some days someday these large mammals might disappear um, it would have been a different and totally different reading, but for me, it came across as arrogant and I thought about how man consumes nature. And that took me to a children's song called, I Know an Old Lady Who Swallowed a Fly. And you will probably be familiar with it, that she swallows a fly and then because of this fly, she ends up swallowing a bird, a cat, a dog, a goat, a cow, a horse, maybe not in that order with the cow and horse, and she does die, all because of this fly. And so my original concept was that I wanted to, in, instead of those animals being eaten, I wanted to invite them to a dinner party. And so I went to the Zoological Museum on the campus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and I explained to the curator my concept and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be needing a cat, dog, a goat, horse. And she kind of looked at me and said, only weird people taxidermy domesticated animals. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what do you have? And so that's when the forest version uh, came into being. And what I really liked about it is, is that animals who might well be predators were coming to a table to enjoy a meal together. And that made me think about a bigger conversation, which I think will resonate with everybody today. It was so much uh, social unrest. We're protesting in the streets, but I often wonder if we could just sit down as people, as people, perhaps adversaries, but we have so, so much in common. And if we could sit at a table and discuss it, then maybe some of the, the world's biggest problems could be solved. Um, that's of course an oversimplification, but I think that one of the things I feel strongly is that uh, you know, ignorance and, and not knowing someone is what causes a lot of this when really we have so much in common. So that's kind of another reading of the dinner party. As to what the animals have for dinner, they all have a little jar of honey, they have a bread roll, and on the table are these very fancy wreath breads, which that was super important to me because mostly I talk about the positive things with insects, but I spent a year of my life living in the Central Pacific in the Gilbert Islands. And that is right on the equator straddling the dateline. And to, <laughs> to get there, there, at that time there was one international flight a week, but most of your standard food, food staples, because this is a coral atoll, nothing grows there except coconut and pandanus trees. So that's a big part of the diet as is fish. But the standard food staples were uh, shipped typically from Australia, and took six months to arrive. And when they uh, arrived, they were distributed throughout the island to these little, I'll call them convenience stores, but it looks more like a stand at a fairgrounds or something, where I could purchase baked bread that they had baked on the premises. And when I sliced open the bread, I was just horrified because it was filled with weevil larvae that they had not sifted the flour. And I just, I had to pick those out and then my piece of bread looked like Swiss cheese. So it's a bit of a negative connotation with insects, but that's why it's very important to me to have the bread. 
And also this uh, bread is kind of set up very memento more-like, and you may be familiar with those still life paintings from kind of the 1500s that look very seductive, very enticing, yet there's something a bit off with them. Typically, you know, a worm coming out of an apple. And memento mori means you too shall die. So that's a nod to that. Yeah. Jennifer, some... we do have a question from Dave, okay. um, who is asking if you have a favorite, excuse me, childhood memory or person that's inspired your art. And he comments that it's so whimsical. Uh -huh. um, I think I would describe it as an experience. I'm from Canada. Uh, I was born in Edmonton, uh, Alberta, so out west, but primarily grew up in Niagara Falls, Ontario, in Toronto, Ontario. And when my family lived in Niagara Falls, on a rainy Saturday or Sunday, my parents would drop my younger brother and I downtown in downtown Niagara Falls. And if you've been there, you know it's full of all sorts of touristy stuff and crazy museums. They would give us the money to, for entrance to a museum. And our favorites were uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not, the Houdini Wax Museum, and the Niagara Falls Museum, which was a Victorian era type museum that, you know, had everything. And on the ground floor were those exhibits about going over the falls in a barrel and things like that, which when you live there, you're like, oh, that old stuff. And we would go up to the top floor where they had the animal oddities, like the taxidermy two-headed calf and the five-legged dog. But there were almost like needlepoint samplers. There were framed works that were insects that had been put into words and pictures. And I found that really, really fascinating. So I guess that that's a childhood experience that I consider um, influential to this practice. Fantastic. And we have another question from Stephen who comments that there are a lot of scientific themes here. And can you comment on how you think about the relationship between art and science in your artwork? And do you yourself have a scientific background? Well, so I, I do frequently get asked if I'm an entomologist and uh, the answer is no. <laughs> I know a fair amount about insects by virtue of them being my material. And I think the connection uh, to art and science is in fact a growing one. And I certainly don't feel that I'm doing anything scientific, but I, I actually have been asked, invited to speak at the American Entomological Society meeting um, one year and made a, a presentation. I think that what art can do for science is perhaps make it uh, more palatable <laughs> to, to the general public. Uh, I had an exhibition at the University of Nebraska that was co-sponsored by the entomology department and at the opening, the chair of entomology uh, made his thank yous. And then he turned to me and he said, thanks for making us look sexy. <laughs> and I think that, uh, you know, insects are the, that lowly creature that perhaps even in the science world, if you're studying insects, it's like, oh, those. <laughs> um, so I think that <clears throat> I, I, Entomologists have certainly uh, supported my work. And I've had groups after speaking at the American Entomological Society meeting, I've had entomologists visit my uh, studio. And I feel, think that uh, what I'm doing is really uh, a, a public service, if, if you will, that I, I get the opportunity, perhaps more so than they do, to talk about insects and their important role that they play in the environment uh, and and that's harder i think i mean everyone expects that of them they don't necessarily expect it of an art exhibition and i really i have to say that <clears throat> how i view my shows has changed dramatically 
particularly over the last 10 years, that I came to insects because, well, from my textile background, I found uh, textiles that were embellished with green metallic beetle wings. And I just thought, oh, these are nature sequins. These are so beautiful. But over time, I have watched insects that used to be very available, not so available. <clears throat> I'm, of course, you know, listening to and, and watching to what's happening in the world. And this is important. Uh, and I think that it finally struck a chord with the honeybees. Uh, but, and then, and then I felt honestly a bit discouraged when I, I started to feel like, okay, this is important work that I'm doing because it's a conversation starter. And then COVID happened. And then, you know, people have, of course, much more immediate worries that are perhaps closer to home. And I feel like the planet got a bit of a break when people were on lockdown, but as we open up and now with the fires and the hurricane, perhaps we are turning back to the environment. Um, so that sort of answers that question, I hope. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, we've had one more question come through uh, from Jay Branch, who asks if you've sourced or built all of the furniture display pieces yourself, um, and specifically, where did the amazing cabinet come from, <laughs> and comments that this work is amazing, thank you. <laughs> uh, the only thing that has, the only things that have been made for me are these somewhat strange stands that these bell jars, the big bell jars are standing on. Um, the tallest one is six feet. Um, so towards the back, you see one of those. And I, I, they were made for a show that happened in Seattle about three years ago and a former assistant of mine works for a custom stair manufacturer in Seattle. And I had this idea of a kind of cathedral to nature. And when you walk into a cathedral, you inevitably, your gaze goes up as you look at the ceiling and stained glass. And so I had this idea of the bell jars being on these tall stands. And it, you know, now that I've said that they came from a stair manufacturer, it probably makes sense um, the way they're turned and you can think of staircases. Uh, so those were made for me. There are seven of those in total. Uh, the other thing that was made for me, and I have several, but there's only one in this show, is the glass, wooden glass case, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, that was made for me. It is, looks very Victorian. In fact, it is a modern case that all comes apart. So the glass comes out and it's much easier to travel with. So I have five or six of those. So that was made. As for the cabinet, I am told it is an old apothecary cabinet. And uh, I got it from a local Madison antique dealer. I saw it online. And I was like, that's it. And I have done two other cabinets. So actually at a recent show in Madison at the Chazen Museum, I had my three furniture type cabinets of curiosity. So that was pretty fun to have those all in the same room. This by far is the biggest, most dramatic. It literally weighs a ton. I think after its life as an apothecary cabinet, which to me makes sense because if you were keeping herbs and medicines, you don't necessarily need all, I'm sure you have your most common ones at easy reach and your less common ones high up but I think it had a life in a church diocese keeping family records because there's some stickers on the far side of it. And I did find a little gold cross in one of the, the drawers. Uh, the person who sold it to me said she had sold it four times over, but then people realized just how big it is and they found they couldn't fit it through their door. So I also had that problem. <laughs> it wouldn't fit in my studio. And so I had to rent a storage locker to put it in <laughs> and took all the drawers out and worked in, in my studio. But it is uh, I'm very happy when it's not in Madison because when it's in Madison, oh, boy, I have to hire these guys. They're called the Boo Burrs since this is Wisconsin and they have to put it in. 
<laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, we have a few more questions that have come through. And just, uh, Jennifer, as a time check, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, was there any other piece that you wanted to highlight in the exhibit before we wrap up with questions? Yeah, let's just take a quick look at that case which again, I, I've talked about memento mori, but it is also set up kind of memento mori style. And what's really important to me is this deer skull that still has some hide on it. And you can see that at some point insects did start chewing at it. And I wanted to have that in because uh, it's one of the important jobs that insects do, that they decompose matter. You know, it's very tempting to, of course, to say we'd live on top of a big trash heap if we didn't have insects, but honestly, we wouldn't be here. So, <laughs> um, so that's really what that's a nod to, that that was an important part of the story that I want to tell of what insects do. And so the skull is there. There's milkweed, and you pretty much all know that uh, monarch butterflies uh, are attracted to milkweed, so that's important there. Uh, there's beeswax flowers that are, they've been cast in beeswax. Um, and then I'll, on the table and in here are those mealworms, which again are sort of have that memento mori reference. So that's that's what's happening with that. So now I'd be happy to answer more questions. Thank you, thank you. Yes, every time I come in here, there's a new detail that I didn't see the first time. Um, Ed asks, or comments first, that it's a unique exhibit with so many intriguing details and asks, how long did it take to set up? He was here for about an hour, fascinated by everything. Well, that's very nice to hear, and I'm glad that people are taking the time. I think partially we've all been cooped up for a long time, and so when you get out, you, you want to take advantage of it. But yeah, there are a lot of details. Like I didn't talk about in the skull, there are some beetles that have um, that are etched with words on them. Maybe Mary can go check those out. And there are a lot of things to discover if you spend the time. Uh, the actual installation took, I'll say, about a month or just over a month. It, I think it might have been faster, but because of COVID, uh, we were very cautious uh, in terms of, you know, how many of us were in this space. But perhaps the the biggest, like on the weekend when the staff wasn't there, like I came in and I just did the skull by myself. Um, and the things around it. Um, but I think part of what, oh yeah, so it says uh, life, I think, and death. There's birth, life, death, secret, promise are the words that are etched on the beetles. And that, I had that done in a trophy shop. And uh, I, I had the idea in the first place because my sister-in-law was working in a trophy shop up in Toronto and she came home with a Brazil nut that they had laser engraved for a client. And I was like, oh, if you can do Brazil nuts, I'll bet you could do Beatles. <laughs> I bet that was the first time they had, they had oh, yeah. done that. That's one to put in their case of you know, things they, they've done. Um, so what really kind of kept things or slowed things down uh, was collecting the taxidermy. And uh, you think it's gonna be easy. Like we knew that there was a loan program from the Carnegie, but their biggest, it's not very dramatic without some big animals. So we were able to get quite a few small animals, um, but getting bigger ones was a challenge. And um, we almost had an albino deer, which would have been like having a magical unicorn. <laughs> but the person who owned that had recently acquired it and wasn't quite ready. Oh, that's the grasshopper from Madagascar. Um, wasn't quite ready to, to let it leave their, their side. So that 
took quite a while and thanks to uh, Trundle Manor, local Pittsburgh institution, <laughs> uh, for lending their, their bear and their badger. Because um, without those, I, I, I really, I was like, we have to have a bigger animal, whether it was a deer or the bear, and finally we got the bear. So, and Trundle right. Manor has a lot of taxidermy. They just, they, they kind of buy old, old taxidermy that no one, no one wants and is in poor repair. Fantastic. Yes, we have the bear right at the, right at the head of the table, <laughs> overseeing everything. Yeah. I think one of the interesting things about this dinner party is there is, we talked about it a lot, there is an empty seat at the other end of the table. And it's kind of inviting, like, should, you know, it, it invites you to join to be perhaps part of the conversation. I understand someone actually did sit down <laughs> one day. I'm fine with that, uh, as long as they don't, you know, touch anything. I, just, I wouldn't recommend eating the bread, that's for sure, <laughs> which has been varnished so that, um, you know, pests are not attracted to it and all the fruit is just uh, plastic. So. Fantastic. Um, next, Loretta asks, what took you to the Gilbert Islands? Ah, a boyfriend. <laughs> I, I had a boyfriend who was in the Peace Corps and I was finishing up my BFA. So he had left uh, a year before me. And once I graduated, I went there and I was hired on locally uh, by the Catholic school. There's in the entire country, the population is a million people scattered throughout the islands. There's only one government run high school in the entire country. And so there are a lot of schools that are run by religious organizations. And so Peace Corps was placing uh, their volunteers in these schools. So my boyfriend was working at the Catholic school. So I got hired and I taught art. It was a very challenging experience, but as an artist, I can say now, uh, one of the most important things I've done because I continue to make work there and I lived in a house that had no electricity, no running water. I think for most, we would call it, probably call it a hut, but actually it was quite nice. Yeah, I had to draw my water from the well. It was on the equator, so it was really hot every day. But I continued to make work. And I think a lot of artists, you move into a new studio and it takes a while to get used to your environment and you have trouble making work. And just that experience taught me I can make work anywhere. And I just, I just really toughened up about every six weeks I get dengue fever and I go, if I'm not better by the end of this month, I'm leaving. And then I'd get better. Um, and it was very difficult when you come from North America and your world shrinks to 25 miles long and a quarter mile wide. It's like being sent to Alcatraz. A fun thing to do was on a Thursday, go to the airport when that one international flight came in and see who was arriving and who was leaving. Uh, you have a new appreciation for the simple things. Absolutely. Um, with just a few minutes left, we have two more questions. One from Kat, who comments, I know the bugs are the star of the show, but I also see a Victorian era theme, both scientific and art historical. Did this come from your experience at the museum as a child, or did that influence come during your art education? I do think it came as a child, and that is very intentional. The Victorian era to me is a, kind of a heyday of science when um, science was really popularized, that there are so many books that were published um, on scientific subjects, but written in a way today that we would just get fed up with. They were very much written as narratives, like Dick and Jane go to their backyard to study an ant colony. And ultimately it is about the ant colony, but there's so much dis, you know, back and forth finality that you're like, get to the point. <laughs> but that was, uh, you know, the reading public just, you know, ate that, that up and people were encouraged 
to um, study things locally. And of course, there were great scientific discoveries. It's kind of the age of, it is the age of steam, and therefore you've got steam ships and um, steam trains, and people traveled much more. And photography, it's the dawning of the age of photography, and people documented their trips. And the Victorians were collectors, and the fact of the matter is they did collect things to, to death. Um, and they had what I always say is very dubious taste, <laughs> which is something I really try to channel. And the Victorian taste, you know, it's just over the top. There is no such thing as too much. And that's definitely what I try to channel. And I think it is um, that museum experience that I described. Also growing up in Canada, um, I think maybe I knew part of my schooling and we focused on Queen Victoria. There's a big statue of her in Toronto in Queen's Park where the provincial parliament is. We have what we didn't, when I was a kid, there was no Canada Day. We had fireworks on Queen Victoria's birthday, Victoria Day. <laughs> and so I just uh, think my grandfather, my father's father emigrated um, from Northern England and I feel like these are things that I kind of grew up with. Fantastic. And to wrap us up, we have from Rosie asking if you can tell us a little bit about your creative process as a whole, whether it's in your work with textiles or creating exhibits. Additionally, are there any additional mediums that you enjoy working in? Um, so I think as an install, as an install, well, first my, my background is in textiles and textile design. And I think that that very quickly explains the patterns on the walls. And also I alluded already to my real interest in insects when I discovered a garment in Northern Thailand that was embellished with green metallic beetle wings. So that's how I got interested in insects in the first place. But as I approach an installation, I, I am interested to know something of the history of the space, of the neighborhood. And I was supposed to make a site visit back uh, last March, but that was right when COVID was hitting. And I do think that this installation might have been slightly different if I had been able to make that visit, but I had to do everything virtually. And I think the mattress factory installations are usually a bit more constructed and conceived on site, but I really wasn't able to do that because of these times we're, we're living in. So I, I think about the history of the space and I talked about the storefront and, and the neighborhood that that was important to me. Um, I think very much about the physical space. This is a long, narrow gallery with a relatively high ceiling. And uh, it reminded me of those spaces uh, when you go to say a public library that has those big hallways before you get to the actual library. So I think the shape of this, this room was important. And then there's just some idea. Every exhibition that I do I hope to learn something new and take it into the next show. And uh, I knew, I did know that the ceiling here was pretty pristine. And the suggestion had been made earlier that if I wanted, I could do something on the ceiling. And this has come up a lot. It's difficult to do. Um, you're just in a very awkward position um, in fact, the insects that you see here, um, Josh, who is the uh, exhibition coordinator, he's the one who did it because I, ref I tried to do it on a weekend, but I felt too unsafe on the ladder. One of the other uh, installation assistants said, no, she wasn't going to do it. And Josh, who's very comfortable in being this on the scaffolding, he ultimately did it. So without his help, that wouldn't have happened. Um, so I, that was an idea that I've had for a while and it was really great to see it be able to happen here and kind of make sense as, you know, this 
initially a decorative detail that we would see around a chandelier and then kind of go off and go crazy. Uh, the lighting, as I've said. Um, and then, you know, the other thing was is that I had all the work in the cabinet that just wasn't being shown. And so I conceived of the, the drawers. Um, so th those are the new things that I brought to this. But I also, to me, the Mattress Factory Museum, I've said, and, and I'm not just saying it now because I'm talking to people at the Mattress Factory, is my favorite museum. So it was a, a real honor to uh, be asked to show here. And I did not want to fall on my face here. So I do feel like this is um, some greatest hits, if you will, uh, that I had only done the cochineal painted wall once before, and that was at the the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery in 2015, and uh, it's pretty dramatic. The dinner party is always something that people really engage with. I feel like this is the last dinner party, at least for a while, unless maybe I got the opportunity to do Australian animals or something like that. I feel like I've kind of exhausted this. Who knows, I say that and maybe something great will, will come up. Um, I, I think the timing was right for this. And then I knew the cabinet was pretty spectacular and so, and it was complete. So I really wanted to share that. As far as other things I do, if I wasn't on my computer, I would uh, walk, I, because I had the University of Wisconsin, we started off the semester, we could teach in person if we wanted, or we could teach online or we could teach a hybrid class. And mine was a hybrid of some in-person and some online, but last, last week or the week before, because of rising COVID numbers among students, we went to all online for at least two weeks, and I doubt very much that we will be back in person. So I'm now in a position of making all sorts of instructional videos and I'm teaching introduction to textiles and we had to think of things that people could do at home. So students are doing natural dyes. So I, ugh, if I could see my fingernails, like I'm just, my hands are constantly blue. Uh, so I've been actually having a lot of fun with the things that I teach, which I really haven't, if I was in person with students, I'd go do a quick demo because people aren't going to sit there forever. Plus, I don't like to show too much because then it takes the sense of discovery away from the students. But when you film a video, you feel a bit like Martha Stewart. It's like you've got to start with nothing and have a finished product at the end. So my students only have to do eight indigo samples. I have like 20 now from demonstrating things. So, I don't know. Today I was cochineal dying, today and yesterday. Um, so, I don't know if that'll end up in anything, but it's something that at this kind of strange time, I'm finding fairly rewarding. Fantastic. Jennifer, thank you so much. Unfortunately, this is all the time that we have today. I did see a couple a couple additional questions come through. If we missed your question, we'll follow up um, with you directly after after this event. Uh, thank you all so much. We just had one comment from Dave that I can't resist sharing with the group. Um, he says, "Thank you so much. This was an inspiring way to start the day." Um, so Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday morning, and for everyone that's with us here today. Please. Um, be sure to come come visit in person. You can pre-purchase your timed entry tickets at our website, mattress.org. Um, as members, you can still reserve your, your always free member tickets online as well to be sure you get in. Um, and it's really just a space that you have to see to see to appreciate in person. It's so beautiful. And thank you for, for walking us through it. Shout out to our camera woman, Mary. <laughs> and again, Jennifer, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye, bye everyone. Have a good weekend.